Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Alan. How are you today? Yeah, good morning, Michael. Do you know what? I'm absolutely fabulous. My glass is always half full, never half empty. So I'm up for this big time. Oh, you're a man after my heart. Yeah, that's brilliant news. I, I really like that positive attitude towards life. So that's brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. And I know our listeners will be absolutely fascinated to hear your story too. So as I do with all of my guests, I ask the first kind of opening question that everything will flow from. And that is, Alan, tell us a little bit about your personal life. So where were you born? Have you moved around? Yes. Um, your education, and then we'll go into your first job and your career to current day. So over to you, Alan. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I was, um, I, I've had, well, up to, up to date, I've had an amazing life. I really have. I've even published many, many books, including my autobiography. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I was born in 1957 uh, on Merseyside, 12 years after the Second World War. Oh, sorry, 12 years after the rationing of the Second World War. Uh, not that I remember any of that. And um, I was born into a loving family. I've got two brothers and um, uh, born on the Wirral. And uh, then I, my education actually was, was abysmal because I ended up spending more time having fun uh, than I did actually learning and I look back now and I think well I wouldn't change anything because one thing that sticks into my mind was my headmaster saying to me many years ago he said Bates you are going nowhere in life <laughs> and I remember about 20 years ago I was live on television in Europe with my own tv show and uh, I was standing in the green room I was mic'd up I'd been to makeup and I was ready to go it was a live it was a live studio set and then um, I walked around the production room, seeing everybody flying around, doing the presenters, doing everything else. And then I suddenly thought back and thought, you remember Mr. Gordon, my headmaster, saying, Bates, you're going nowhere in life. And it was such a, it was such a really cool moment for me because I didn't plan the way things were going to turn out. But uh, so education wise, not brilliant at all. Um, I was good at engineering. I was good at making things. I loved fixing things. So that was the only thing I really excelled in. And um, engineering, I got I got school prize every year for engineering. And my family are engineers, so it ultimately set the the die, uh, set it in stone, and I was going into engineering, which I did. And um, I did an apprenticeship as a tool maker, which in itself is a, is a, is, a, is a good job, mm. uh, but it wasn't suited for me. And at the same time, I started DJing in nightclubs and comparing and doing some uh, acting. And, um, and, and then I got the opportunity to go to America in 1977, 78, to work, right. for, to work for Carnival Cruise Lines. Oh, yeah. And this goes to show that it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yes. Absolutely in this life. So I was invited to go to work in the casino department fixing the slot machines. And I eventually worked myself up to become the casino manager. Mm. So, uh, you know, at the age, I should have been 21. You've got to be 21 to actually uh, to do this job. I That's right. 19. So How did you manage that? Who you know? <laughs> <laughs> you hypnotized them. <laughs> yeah, no, this is before. I mean, at this point, yeah. you know, as, as I, I, I didn't even know what hypnosis was. I've never no. been subjected to any of it. So anyway, so I'm working in the Caribbean at the age of 19, a young scallywag from the Wirral uh, near Liverpool. And... Um, so it all started from there, really. I think that was my first big break in life because I went from, you know, living on the Wirral to cruising the Caribbean to, you know, from um, uh, from, from uh, Biscayne Boulevard to uh, to all the Caribbean islands. And then I, I joined other companies and I worked. I lived in Boston for a while. I worked out in New York for a while. So I got to do a hell of a lot of traveling, which was was one of the makings of it, it really is to be able to go and see different cultures, different people eating different foods. It yes. really opens your mind up. I know. So th this is how it all started for me. I, I think I was very, very lucky. And um, I mean, at one point I was uh, working in a casino and 
uh, there was a Scottish um, illusionist on board. He was an entertainer and he could use hypnosis and he did a demonstration for us. Yeah. I thought, this is, this is crazy. This. I really don't believe this. Would you like me to tell you the story? What happened? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Because it is part of, it, it is part of what brought me into the world of hypnosis. Absolutely. And, and that was, I, I was with a young American girl. My scene open, I closed at one o'clock in the morning. I met her at the disco. We're having a few drinks. Everything's going really well. She's a very, very pretty young American lady. And um, uh, this particular Scottish guy, when he'd had a few drinks, he was a bit obnoxious. And you didn't want him around. He'll spoil your fun, so to speak. So I saw him come in staggering over and he said, can I come and join you? And I said, I said, do you mind? He said, I'm in company. Maybe we'll have a, a drink another time. Mm. And he said, oh, he said, I'll bet you five dollars I can get, get her to leave you in five minutes. And I said, well, OK, then if I give you five minutes and bet you five dollars, will you go away? And he said, <laughs> he said, yeah, OK. So anyway, um, he took this lady who was very keen on me uh, being, you know, um, being, uh, being English, being British, and Liverpool, mm. you know, the Beatles. So, yes, Paul mm. McCartney used to come round to our house mm. for Sunday lunch every every Sunday. <laughs> and it worked well with the girls. Yes. Uh, so, anyway, um, so this particular illusionist, his name is John, he took this lady over to a table and I was watching. I thought, what's, what's going on here? And within five minutes, uh, she stands up, she walks over to me and she said, um, Alan, Good night, and good night to John. Walked off. Oh my goodness! How did you do that? He said I hypnotised her, and I said, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Give me five dollars." So give him the five dollars, and and he walked away. Yeah, and then she walked away. Give him the five dollars, and that was it. Then I was absolutely captivated. Hypnosis. I thought it was a load of nonsense. Mm. And long story short, but when I came back to England, I picked up on the career of the entertainment side. So I was working, I was working in radio stations. I was uh, doing a bit of acting. I was comparing acts in nightclubs, I was DJing. So, so I, I, and I was doing really well. And then one night I compared a stage hypnotist. I thought this is bringing back, uh, bringing back memories of what happened on the cruise ship. Mm. So it was before the days of the internet. So that was it. And I thought, I'm going to study this a little bit more, not for hypnotizing girls, but just to see what it's all about. Yeah. So anyway, I um, uh, I went to the library and I got lots of books out and I read up and I've become fascinated in the more. And I, th I thought the, the reading, the psychology side was really hard work, actually. Mm. Uh, but you've got to understand the psychological side to be able to uh, to do what, you know, what, what I do now. Of course. So um, anyway, I, I, I built up my own show uh, without copying anybody's routines. I became a comedy stage hypnotist. I learned that uh, I, I was doing all the backstreet clubs in Liverpool and, and then I started doing the tour around the UK uh, and I was starting to you know get quite well known and I got my first break on Granada TV and uh, which was a really an hour long program on hypnosis. Then so I, how did that come about then? Did they just spot you in the, in the clubs? Uh, or? Yes, yeah, they were doing a debate on hypnosis. Uh, so they got in touch with me and by now, um, I was starting to get quite a good reputation. I was doing right. theatres. I went from backstreet work in men's clubs uh, to being able to uh, take this forward with my own show. I was promoting with my team in booking theatres, right. selling the tickets. Right, right. You know, and, um, and at that particular time, it was very lucrative. I was really honing and developing my skills as a, uh, you, you, it works twofold as a comedy stage artist. You're using stagemanship, so you've got to have that charisma. You've got to have that ability to draw people in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. But then also using the psychological side of hypnosis. And basically, the idea is to find susceptible people who I can hypnotize very, very quickly because um, the audience don't want to be waiting around forever to be entertained. No. So I've got to find the people who are very susceptible to hypnosis. I can hypnotize very quickly, and then the show is fast paced, fast moving, and audience participation, and away you go. Mm. So, uh, so I built this reputation up as a hypnotist. Then I went on the Joan Bakewell show, 
um, heart of the matter. I don't know if you remember that from BBC One primetime TV. Oh, before that, I did the Esther Ranson show. That's life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, and that, that went out to millions and millions of people. And a big part of that particular show was about me um, hypnotising, uh, well, using hypnosis. But that, that in itself is a story which we wouldn't have time to get everything in today. No. So, yeah, so, so then um, uh, I started, um, I was in demand then overseas. So I had an agency in London and they used to get me a lot of work all over the world, everything. Everyone from Egypt to Bahrain to Dubai to Sharjah to Bali, uh, Indonesia. Uh, so I was building my reputation, meeting lots of people. But what I must say at this point is from the very, very beginning of my hypnotic career, I was always asked, um, can you stop me smoking? Can you take my phobias off? Can mm. you make me feel less stressed? Mm. So. Uh, I was doing this free of charge and never turned anybody down. If anybody came to see me for help. Yeah. Um, and I found that I had this amazing skill of helping people. So I was making my living now as a comedy stage hypnotist, doing theatres, cabaret. I was one of the biggest players on the university student union circuit for, for about 15 years. I mean, come fresh I was literally London one night, Glasgow the next night, back up to London the next night. South Wales, North Wales, all over the country. But um, got the energy, I still have. Um, and uh, so really happy with what I'm doing. I, and then I did some high profile TV shows in this country and overseas. I was invited yes. on the Graham Norton show, uh, which was a real big career break. Because yeah. Graham, the Graham Norton show is very, very well liked and received yeah. by the British public and overseas as well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, people even now say to me, oh, I saw you on the Graham North show. Uh, and then I had the uh, opportunity to go work in Malta, which was another massive big influence in my life. I mean, as Confucius states, choose a job that you really like and you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> yes. That's very true, you know. Yes. Uh, and I often talk about that with, you know, with, um, with yeah, dinner parties and, and interviews. So anyway, I got, uh, I think it was about, I'm trying to work out, 2002, I think it was. I went out to Malta to do a corporate show uh, for the government. And it went down so well that they invited me to come back the following week for a television show, mm. uh, a show called uh, Sharabank, spelled with an X. Like as in Sharabank, the coaches, the old coaches, but spelled right. with an X. Right. And um, so uh, we decided to start doing therapeutic work. So mixing the comedy element with the um, psychological side of hypnosis with people's phobias, uh, whether it's cockroaches, because we don't get cockroaches in the UK. There's loads of them in the summertime in Malta, in the Mediterranean. Yes. So overnight, I was a, I was a sensation and it took off. And we said, oh, could you come back next week and do another program? Can you come back next week? Can you come back? So this has continued now for about 20 years. So every single month, every single month um, for the last 20 years, I've been going over to, to Malta and not all for television, mm. um, because when I started doing the therapeutic work and then I got I was qualified then as a, a qualified UK British hypnotherapist, it went from entertainment to to my services being uh, required as a therapist. Yes. So, so um, and the transition became smooth. It was it was great. I still do well. I don't do the stage work at the moment because of uh, COVID, the situation mm. we're in. Mm. Um, but I continue to work as a as a therapist because I'm working with people with mental health issues. Yes. So um, uh, unfortunately, the summer of 2020, I had to stop traveling to Malta, where I went back in September, October, November. Yes. And then um, because of the quarantine situation, it was, um, I, I couldn't actually travel because mm. if I and if I travel to Malta, I have to quarantine two weeks before I do my work and when I get back. So at the moment, that's all on hold. Uh, yes. But the transition went from entertaining people with hypnosis uh, over to working basically as a full-time therapist. And right. that's what people know me for, more so now in, um, uh, as, as a hypnotherapist. 
But I still do, or I will still be doing, um, the entertainment side. Because there's a, a, a long-standing organisation uh, in Great Britain called FESH, the Federation of Ethical Stage Artists. It mm. was set up in the 1970s by eminent uh, stage hypnotists at the time, who were very well known, who have now passed away. And I pick up that mantle, and I'm actually now the chairman of the Federation of Ethical Stage. Right, right. Uh, well, you know, we deal with local councils regarding licensing matters. We deal with disputes if people are, are making television programs and they want serious advice on, on um, how hypnosis works and, mm. you know, practitioners. Uh, they, come, they come to us as an organization, and as the head of the organization, they come to me. Yes. So, um, so that's interesting. Uh, and then um, I went to writing books. Um, I started off with a book I thought, I'll do an autobiography called Hypnotic Star, which looking at it now, it was very poorly written and absolutely dreadful. And I don't promote that. It's not available to buy. Right. I, I replaced that with um, Alan Bates' Wide Awake which was the uh, the third biggest selling um, book in Malta about six years ago. Right. Uh, and it, you know when you're doing quite well, when um, people are parodying you in, in, in Parliament. And when you go to the airport, your books are in the, the, the duty-free lounge. Yes. And then quite often I thought to myself, Mr. Gordon Bates, you're going nowhere in life. <laughs> and I thought, wow. Um, if I could just go back in time now. Um, because I tend to get really excited when I'm talking about my work. Because I love what I do. Yes. I, I, I'm not sort of big-headed in the, in the fact that I'm pushing my image forward. I just love what I do. I love helping people. I love entertaining people. But yeah. going back uh, 19... I'm unsure of the date without checking my diary. I think it was 1993. I was invited to go out to, to Brunei uh, to entertain... Uh, Princess Giran Hamida, and it was her birthday, and I was invited. Um, there was there was a singer at the time, an American singer called MC Hammer. Yes, I don't remember the song. Can't touch this. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, of course. Yes. <laughs> well, he was booked to do a show on her birthday, and for some unseen circumstances, he he let her down. So it was last right. minute. I got this telephone call in the middle of the night. Uh, Alan, can you come over to Brunei? And the next day I thought, was I dreaming then? And then two days later, <laughs> I got the air tickets for first class Singapore Airlines. Oh, wow. Uh, so so I, I went out there and I can't talk too much about it because um, it was because of them being a royal family. And uh, they, all I can say, it was the most amazing experience mm. that I've had up to date. To be able to stand, it was an afternoon show. To be able to stand up and say, uh, "Your Royal Highnesses, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon." It was just mm. like, "Mr. Gordon Bates, you're going nowhere in life." <laughs> <laughs> I'm addressing and performing for the Royal Family of Brunei, which was absolutely amazing. And since then, I've uh, I've been out to that part of the world, Southeast Asia, many occasions. I, I've done big comedy festivals in Jakarta, and I'm opening an office as soon as COVID's finished. I have a, an agent over there, and we're going to replicate the um, the, the Malta model, and we're going to take that over to... Um, I've already done television in, in, in Asia many times, mm. um, but um, we're doing it on a bigger platform as soon as the uh, COVID's out of the way and we can travel. But, uh, yeah, so... Um, just a question on the Malta model. Yeah. So essentially, what is that model in Malta that you're... The, the, the Malta model it started off with entertainment, went into the therapeutic side. Yes. Because um, when people can see you uh, demonstrating, because um, we used to, we, we made many, many television programs, many episodes of Sharabank, uh, and it was billed as, you know, Alan Bates on Sharabank, which built my reputation. So I was a household name in Malta. So people yes. knew that if they had psychological issues, whether it be stress, anxiety, wanting to lose weight, stop smoking, uh, phobias, that, that's the main area. But I also work with children. I, I uh, work with suicide cases. And it's not, I mean, 
the amount of things that people, I've written a book uh, called Trade Secrets mm. and Confessions of a Hypnotist. Th these books are available on Amazon and they explain some of the cases. Everything's confidential, nobody's name or even the countries on my screen. Uh, so that I'm not sort of referring to, I wouldn't like somebody to pick one of my books up and read it and think he's talking about me. So I've mm. changed it around a little bit, uh, but there's, there's there's no way that that person could be identified. But yes. I, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, two years ago, I lose track of time. Uh, I think it was about two years ago, I had a, a, an elderly lady see me in Malta and she had um, misplaced or lost or had stolen 4,000 euros. Now she had 4,000 euros um, in an envelope and she can't remember where she put it. Mm. And she, she was, the senility was starting uh, to settle in. And she wasn't sure whether a, um, a housemaid had taken it or whether it was thrown out. So she just mm. didn't know where this 4,000 euros was. She came for a session with me and under deep hypnosis, I regressed the back and we found that I got her to relive the memory of what she did with this 4,000 euros. And she placed it at the back of a certain wardrobe in a certain panel on the left-hand side behind the skirt and board. And I got a call from my manager agent a couple of hours later to say, yes, it was there. So oh it's not God. all about healing people. No. Now, um, taking off one comedy hat and putting on a therapeutic hat, mm. now I'll take that off. And I'll put another hat on um, with past life regression. Mm. Now, um, now this once again a, another um, uh, an amazing time of my life. Uh, I'm going between on the timeline of my career. I'm jumping backwards and forwards, and I hope that's okay, Mike. That's absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah, I hope the listeners are keeping up. Come on, wake up, yeah, yeah, keep yeah, up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you're back in the room. Why yes, away. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, Oh, just just an interesting uh, point here. Um, whenever you watch a television program with hypnosis, even my TV shows or anybody else, Paul McKenna from the old days, you mm. never see a hypnotic induction. Why? No. Because it's against the broadcasting uh, standards to an Ofcom to broadcast a hypnotic induction. Because could right. you imagine this? You know, there's a few million people watching my show and I'm hypnotizing them taking them into a very, very deep, sleepy state of mind. You can have some little old ladies who've got the tea in the oven and they're sitting there now while I'll lock my fingers, they're locking tightly together and I'm falling fast asleep. Meanwhile, the dinner on the stove is set on fire. <laughs> so it's, you know, obviously we don't broadcast the hypnotic no. induction. It's very powerful, uh, but it's, it's common sense. And uh, yeah. in the UK and uh, civilized worlds anyway, they won't allow that to happen. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, so putting back the hat on of um, Alan Bates' uh, regression, um, going back many, many years ago, uh, once again into the 90s, uh, 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 the, the biggest name in Liverpool as a psychic medium to go and have a, uh, have a psychic reading was Derek Akora. Yes. From Most Haunted. So I went for a reading with, with Derek Akora, didn't know him, and mm. he said to me, um, I've got your grandparents here, Mary and Lena. Well, yes, he had my grandparents there. However, that wasn't even their real names, that was their nicknames. So he brought my dead grandparents back with their nicknames. And I thought, you've got my attention now. Yes. So I had a reading of him and he was, ab he, he, he was knockout. He really was. As a one-to-one mm. -one reading, he could not, could not, have known the information that he gave me. Mm. If we've got time later in the interview, I'll come back to the most amazing story from Derek. But anyway, um, a year later, um, I get a call off Derek Akora, and he said, Alan, he said, my guide Sam said, we're gonna work together. And, I, and he said, I've got no idea how we're gonna work together. Well, I said, well, you know, maybe I can do past life regression, take people into past lives and we can set up a show, which we did, called The Paranormal Experience. And this was before Derek had even been on stage. Derek had never even been on, held a microphone on stage before wow. until he wow. met me. Wow. So we developed this and we put, and bearing in mind how I've already done the theatres and television. So mm. Derek and I joined forces and we put together this show called The Paranormal Experience. And we took it all over the country. We took it to 
to Jersey, to the Fort Regent Theatre in Jersey. We did the Benidorm Palace, biggest stage in Europe. Uh, and we, we were selling out, we were packing theatres out with what we were doing. And uh, Derek, Derek was being Derek, as in Most Haunted, and my input was past life regression. So yes. I would hypnotise members of the audience and they would, they would go into a state of hypnotic trance. And then during that state of hypnotic trance, I would take them back into a past life. Mm. Now, the common denominator in the world's religions is a belief in the afterlife. Yes. So um, we could talk about this separately, this issue, and go on for hours. But just to condense it a little bit, um, the, the information that, that I would get from these people, and we'd encourage people to Google live as, as, as we're doing the show. So uh, I would have people who, uh, um, people had passed over in the Second World War who, who give us their name, where they were, their family history, their regimental history and everything else, uh, where they passed away. And meanwhile, people are Googling this in real time in the audience and saying, yes, John Jones, he was from Siren Sesca. Yes, we've got it here now. There was a pub called The Green Hand, and, and he did have a, a father that lived in this village. So, so it, it, was, it was absolute vibrant, the mm -hmm. show. And then I'd call Derek in, into, uh, onto the, back onto the stage, and he would look as a psychic medium into uh, these uh, uh, past life regression cases, and he would then communicate with the spirit in a past life, and... It was just absolutely amazing. And beyond any reasonable doubt, beyond any reasonable doubt, um, the information that we were getting, um, we actually did a, a TV show uh, 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 based on this. It was just absolutely fascinating. Without any reasonable doubt, did uh, you, the results that we got were very positive. Yeah. Did you see, by any chance, do you have Netflix? I'm sure you probably do. Yes, but... yeah, yeah. Uh, have you seen the latest documentary series about, uh, oh, what's the title of it? It'll come to me in a minute. Something like Life After Death or something. Uh, yes, uh, I have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Yes, I know. Yeah, I did watch it uh, recently. It'll come to me in a minute. Um, yes, I know the one. Yes, I did okay. watch it. Because it, it <laughs> yeah. was a series and they, That's covered, right. uh, they covered mediums. That's uh, right. And they, they covered past lives. And they did the uh, past uh, life, uh, you know, these kids who have these memories. Yeah, that's right. As youngsters of this pilot in this. Yes, that's you the know, one. Who, I did see it. I yeah. mean, surviving, surviving death. That's it. Surviving yeah. death, Netflix. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's interesting because my wife and I are quite interested in the topic. And a few years ago, we did a past life regression on each other. All right, okay. And um, my wife found the notebook the other day. She said, look, these are the notes we took when we did past life regression yeah. on each other. Yeah. And um, for me, there was a just a very quick story. Um, I was taken back to Roman times okay. where I was this very significant, well-known and famous kind of teacher and author. But I was living in, we were living in tents then. Mm -hmm. And I had all my, my writings kind of in, in scrolls and, and things like that. Yeah. But what was happening is people were stealing them. And of course you don't, you know, it's not like digital now you've got these things. If somebody steals a scroll, it's gone forever. You can't right, yes. recreate it. Unless it's the Dead Sea Scrolls and they're found thousands of years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and of course, some of that um, presented itself in my current life for having a fear of writing um, because I had this belief that if I write, uh, people will steal my material. All oh, right, okay. And it stopped me from writing. I mean, I, ch I changed my mind about about 15 years ago or so when I first started blogging. So, and I've written a lot of blogs since then. So, I mean, it's kind of gone now, yeah. but it so was very interesting. What, was yeah. Reflecting into this life. That's right. So it was very interesting how it was prevent stopping me from actually getting on and doing some writing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an interest in it, but it, it stopped me. I mean, I'm not a published author. 
I'm, well, we're just starting actually, but even so, I've still got tiny bits of kind of hesitation in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I think past life regression can be both fascinating and interesting, but it can also be very healing. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, you know, if you look at Tesla, vibrations, vibrations and frequency. Okay? Yes. Um, I d truly don't know how I do what I do. Uh, it's no matter what you do in life, you have to get results. And um, I work very hard as a hypnotherapist. I have a clinic in Bebbington on the Wirral, which is near where I live, uh, uh, which I'm available for any clients that live on the Wirral. Uh, who have psychological issues and they want to uh, do something about them. Uh, but I, I also have my clinic in Malta, which I go to every single month, uh, yeah. which I um, obviously can't go at the moment until COVID's lifted. Um, and we're going to be setting up, um, uh, as you said before, the, the Malta model, uh, what works. Um, we're going to be setting that up in Jakarta. I have an agent management, uh, manager who I've worked with before. He's a British guy who's Who's that's indonesia out, so. correct sorry that's indonesia indonesia yeah jakarta yeah. great place um great location it's yeah it um, used to be a dutch colony many years ago yeah uh, but you're also in the area where you've got singapore which is two hours now singapore is my favorite place i used to have a fan club in singapore i used to go out there regular and yeah. i used to uh, work to live audiences uh, film television and lots of radio interviews and lots of theatre shows in Singapore. My favourite place in the world. I've travelled all over the world. Um, mm. You know, I, I love what I do. Uh, I'm also a retired pilot as well. I used to fly aeroplanes, but that's another story. <laughs> remember, remember the head teacher, Bates, you're going nowhere in life. <laughs> but, um, you then, haven't I, let that one go, have you? <laughs> no, I'm not letting that one go. But all, all, all in good faith. And, I know. Uh, because one thing life has taught me is always expect the unexpected because yes that's know. our that's our you phrase never know here. what's going to happen this afternoon i know and considering that my education uh, was pretty appalling you know i went on to you know to, to to publish five books which are all available on amazon and um you know i i i you know i really really enjoy writing and it's something at school I thought, you know at school mr gordon would say you've got to go on to publish i've actually written more books but uh i've actually published five and my favorite my favorite two uh my last book which is uh based on ufos um and uh the paranormal and also i i wrote a book called uh true uh, alan bates true ghost stories they're available on amazon Mm. Um, and I like to look at it if if I hadn't if I hadn't um, put pen to paper, so to speak, and published them books, and I was to read that book, would I enjoy it? And just two weeks ago, I picked up UFOs Wide Awake. Uh, sorry, uh, UFOs. It's time to wake up. And I mm. read it unbiased by being the author, and it was fabulous because I covered everything from ayahuasca DMT uh, to Hitler's fascination with the paranormal um, uh, to encounters I've had personally uh, with UFOs. And I interviewed um, uh, serving police officers on Merseyside, sh retired ship captains, uh, pilots, myself. And, you know, so all the experiences that we've had and put together. I was also involved with Rendlesham Forest. I don't know if you're aware of, of that story. No. Uh, you've heard of Roswell. Yes. Roswell is the world's biggest uh, conspiracy, for want of a better word. Yes. Um, it did happen. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, so Rendlesham Forest was Britain's uh, Roswell. It happened in 1980 uh, on the US Air, uh, Bentwaters Air Base. And um, it, was, it was over the Christmas period and Boxing Day. Um, I, I'm not going to elaborate too much on this because it's a, it's a, it's a, a massive story in itself. Mm. And it's still ongoing now. Mm. Um, uh, but I was invited for a TV documentary um, along with Nick Pope, who is the um, uh, ex-Ministry of Defence, the British X-Files, uh, and also Colonel Charles Holt, who was the deputy base commander. With the, the, the production company flew him over from America. And mm -hmm. on the 30-year anniversary, we sat in Rendlesham Forest, exactly where this UFO landed. 
the British police were involved, the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, American policemen all witnessed it, it's all there. Um, and um, it was a, it's a fascinating story. For, for the, for so the where is that? It, it's in Suffolk, not Suffolk. far from Ips Ipswich. Right. Um, but um, yeah, my input of that was uh, to hypnotize a local lady who claims to have been abducted locally by UFOs. Right. And, um, you know, read into this as you will, but it, it was fascinating. It was a little, it brought back memories of doing regression with Derek Okora. But I regressed this lady and she was the host for uh, this alien being who was communicating through her uh, to me. Uh, and uh, it was like watching a ventriloquist work because mm. her vocal cords were not in sync mm. with the voice that was coming out. It was really strange. Mm. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the big question was um, in 1980 with Greenham Common and nuclear disarmament um, and the, the Americans were not supposed to be storing nuclear weapons on British soil, but they were. Mm. And when I put the question to Colonel Charles Holt, you know, can you answer that question? And he, he came out with a classic, I cannot uh, confirm, but I cannot deny. In other words, yes, of course we were having nukes being stored there. And mm. the, 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 it's interesting because, I mean, just listening to, uh, just watching Ancient Aliens and Nick Pope, who is an amazing guy, amazing speaker, Richard Von Dannigan, Charity, the guards and everything, they, they, they've all got evidence, they all know that we've been visited and you know we've you know as i say this is maybe we could talk another time about you know this about my book <laughs> ufos because it's a fascinating it's a fascinating topic and i think the 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 trouble is people want to believe and they are too scared to believe at the same time it's one of these really tricky areas for people to to get their mind around and it doesn't matter how much evidence you show and say this is real yeah. and people are going to go yeah but where's the proof well here's the proof here's the proof yeah we yeah have but proof it, it's, it's up it's up now it, it now MUFON which is the uh, the network um in in the United States well it's, it's up all over the world they're basically saying now it's up to the government to, to prove it doesn't uh, exist because we have that evidence to prove it does exist Mm. But just think about this for one moment, Michael. What would happen? What would happen if this disclosure came this afternoon? The stock markets would collapse completely. Mm. Uh, the world would go into disorder, mm. loss of humanity. People wouldn't go to work. The supermarkets would run out. The petrol stations would run out. We would completely, it would be lawlessness like you've never believed. We only have to look at what's happened with COVID, trying mm. to get toilet roll, mm. you know? Mm. trying to feed the, your children when there's no food in the supermarket, the mm. world would break down um, all because we're, it, 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 of this disclosure. It's going to happen. It, it will happen. And I hope it happens in my lifetime. Uh, but what do people need? Do they need that spacecraft to land on the White House lawn and say, you're not alone, we're here? For a start, the world's religions would fall apart. Mm. Mm. Humanity would fall well, apart. Is, so here's a theory for you, and this has just come to me in my head right now as you're speaking, is what we're going through like a dress rehearsal? I've already right? thought that. I thought about that when COVID hit last year. <clears throat> because if, if governments can control us in some way, have us to calm down and sit, stay at home, mm -hmm. you know, they can do that for other events as well. In the same way, yeah. If you, you look know, at the research that that's going to be uh, the think tanks that are going to come from this now, there's people studying this now, studying people's behaviour mm. and how people behave and what to expect. It, it, you know, because it, you know, it, something's going to happen in the future. We don't know what, but it will. <clears throat> yes. Nothing lasts forever. You know, no. and I, I think that um, you know, if if you, if you look at uh, virtue, of the fact that if if extraterrestrials can come to this planet, whether they're using different propulsion systems, wormholes, the, the Rosenberg, Eisenhower, Rosenberg uh, wormhole theories to get to this planet, or whether it's just different, slipping into different dimensions, 
Um, if they can do that, they're obviously more advanced than we are. And I could imagine them sitting there now looking at us uh, with the wars that are still going on, killing people. If you actually look at what human beings can, uh, are capable of, you know, in my mother's lifetime, mm. the Second World War, six million Jews killed. You know, if, if extraterrestrials are looking at us, saying they're barbaric creatures, which we are. Not everybody, mm. but we are a barbaric you know, creature. Mm. You know, and if we can do this to our own people, mm. what are we capable of? Mm. You know, it's just, mm. it, it's going to be interesting because there's so many what ifs and, you know, buts and maybes, but I do believe that um, we will get uh, uh, disclosure at some point. Um, the famous guy in America, uh, Dr. Dr. Greer, Stephen Greer, he recently um, produced a, uh, a movie called uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, which is, you know, for anybody who's interested in what we're talking about now, watch it. Absolutely amazing. Very, very switched on guy. He used to um, advise Clinton and several of the other presidents, and he's a very, very interesting chap. Mm. You need to get him on. Get him on, get him on your channel. <laughs> very interesting guy. So did you hear recently, I mean, it was literally in the last couple of months, that there is some Israeli defense ex-minister. Yes, I've seen that. Yeah, who confirmed that there is information available and Trump might be releasing it. <laughs> yeah, yes, I know. And I was really hoping for that to come out. Yeah. Uh, it would be a big move. But you see, the thing is, uh, in in government, it's all compartmentalized. So, mm. you know, sometimes the presidents are not privy to all what's going in the black ops and the different, and, and what they do is like when they're manufacturing, um, whether it's alien technology, back engineering or whatever, um, there'll be engineering companies all over the world, all over America, all making a certain part. And they've got no idea what this part does. And nobody knows what it's about. But when all these parts come together and mm. they're fitted together, you know, um, they're the training on the proving grounds in, in, in the United States. So it's fascinating stuff. I mean, what's happening now with, with uh, because the, not just the Americans, but everybody, the, the Russians, the Chinese, the British. Um, if you come up with something, um, they want to look at the, the elements that they can use for warfare. Yes. Which is so sad. Once again, it's so mm. sad that they, you know, I mean, zero point energy, zero point field. Yeah. You know, if uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Greer uh, reckons uh, conclusively that it's proven that you can have a, 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 a small box in your home, which would power everything in your home with clean energy. Mm. But unless you can put a meter on it, nobody's interested. No. You know, where's the moral compass in that? Mm. You know, if, if, you know, we're trying to remove our car or reduce our carbon footprint. But what happens if the energy, the zero point energy, zero point field is here and we can harness that energy, clean, mm. free energy mm. for everybody around the world. Mm. But unless you can put a meter and start charging people, they don't want to know petro, petro dollars. They, where, that would just disappear like that. Absolutely. Well, it is going to disappear eventually, maybe not in our lifetime, but it is going to you know, the petrodollars will disappear, but they want it on their terms and they want to do it gradually. Exactly. So that, so that you're quite right. When there is the alternative, they can charge for the alternative. And it's, it's likes of helium three. Have you heard of helium three? No. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, solar system is consistently bombarded with radiation from the sun mm. now because, because of our uh, defense system, we're shielded uh, from uh, from a lot of the radiation, but the moon isn't. The moon right. isn't. So over billions of years, the the moon has gathered radiation in its soil, in it, it, in it on its surface, and that that is called helium three and helium right. three. And they reckon if you could consolidate it, uh, burn it, and, and bring it together as a solid, and bring a one payload one payload over uh, uh, on uh, uh, back to Earth. It would power the whole of the United States for one year on one oh payload, and, and that's why, that's why the Chinese, the Russians, uh, the Americans are all wanting to go back to the moon because this helium three is there. It's on the surface of the moon. Unbelievable! Yeah. No, and I you need to look in. That. You need to look into that. 
Because the mm. majority of people just go around with their head buried in the sand. They believe what they want to believe. They don't look at the skies. That they, they don't open their minds. Well, it, it it takes us full circle though, Alan, in terms of your your hypnosis, your hypnotherapy. You know that. Because why are people walking around like zombies and yeah. not investigating and being aware? Because they've been hypnotized Absolutely. to believe certain things, you know. So governments around the world do hypnotize all of us because if we did go and discover this knowledge, yeah. you know, that's why we are all tied down to jobs and mortgages. Yes. Because right. if we have jobs and mortgages, we will stay quiet. Yeah. And we won't ask the difficult questions because yeah. the only thing we have to focus on, as you said earlier, is feed our children, yeah. get money to pay yeah. for a house and feed our children. Uh, that is the, the basis where they want us to live at. So, yeah, governments are very responsible for hypnotizing populations <laughs> yes. and keeping them silent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, if you look at what hypnosis is nobody has a true definitive answer when i get asked what is hypnosis an altered state of awareness um how does it work mm. if you think about the sleep state mm. human beings we as human beings sleep between 20 and 30 years of our lives away mm. so 20 to 30 years of my life and your life is spent sleeping mm. nobody questions that it's just no. something we do at night or you know, we, we as human beings, we can't function without sleep. We have to go to sleep. But mm. during that sleep state, what is actually happening? Is that the reality and we're living in the dream world? Or is it the other way around? It is <laughs> fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. But as a hypnotist, wearing different hats, whether it's a regression therapy, whether it's past life regression, whether it's comedy entertainment on stage, the actual hypnotized state of mind is all the same. Okay. Yes. And most people, most people, it depends what you want to do with it. You've got the subject hypnotized. What do you want to do with that subject? Do you want to take them into a past life? Mm. Do you want to um, try and heal them of their psychological issues? Or do you want to purely entertain them mm. on stage? Mm. Either way, that state of hypnosis is a very, very powerful state of mind. There's mm. No doubt about that. Well, the first time I was hypnotized was by my uncle in Florida, uh, just outside Miami. When I was 15 years old, I traveled from a place called Suriname, which is like Dutch Guiana next to British and French Guiana, the, uh, South America, where we were living. And my sister and I, for our 15th birthday, could travel to Florida to be with my aunt and uncle and uh, for like a week or so and he used to do this as a bit of a hobby hypnotize people and he took so i was 15 and he took me back to age of four and he asked me what i saw and i i i can't remember exactly all of the things i said but i remember my voice changed to that of a four-year-old i spoke like a four-year-old my 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 english wasn't that good then but i spoke in english and but i spoke like a little boy and the, and the, the language was very strange yeah. i could hear some of it i was con i could hear it but i couldn't stop it if you know yeah. what i mean it it's was very very bizarre yeah absolutely fascinating it, it and so I mean, that was a totally real experience. And, you know, they told me things that I didn't remember of what I did and said. Um, and so you, it does make you wonder what the brain holds on to and what the brain is, you know, yeah. uh, capable of. Because, we, you know, so we only use a tiny percentage of our brain capacity. Yeah. And we we think the same thoughts every single day yeah which is another thing because through thinking the same thoughts every single day we hypnotize ourselves too mm -hmm. well all hypnosis is self-hypnosis 
Albert Einstein said in in 1920 that the uh, the conscious mind is just the tip of the iceberg. The, the iceberg is the subconscious. And, yes. You know, he nailed that one big time. I mean, yes. talking about changing your voice when you were regressed. I once did a, a, a documentary um, with a guy called Gary Dakin, who was a trans medium, and it scared the life out of me um, because he, kept, he came out to my house. We did it in, in my home. And I regress, and I've never seen anything like this before, where a medium, a trans medium, can literally transform into somebody else. And mm. th this particular guy, his face changed, his jaw dropped like he had Bell's palsy, his eye dropped down, he, um, uh, the slava was just dripping down his chin, and the voice that came out of that mouth was not Gary Dakin. Mm. And he told me a couple of personal things, which I won't... Um, uh, go into here live, um, which came to fruition many, many years ago. But mm -hmm. his parting, his parting knowledge was the Earth is going to be hit with an asteroid, and I can't remember now how many years ago. Uh, I, sorry, in what uh, at what date it's going to be hit? Well, we know mm -hmm. we can't we we can't get around that. One day we're going to we're going to be hit by something, and it's going to cause a lot of mm -hmm. you know for the inhabitants of the Earth. Mm. Like, like what happened to the dinosaurs many, many years mm. ago. Mm. But um, yeah, I mean, th th that in itself is, you know, what are we tapping into when we go in, when we, we go into this, into this state of mind? Mm. Now, when I'm do doing the regression, I always give um, my, um, uh, my clients, if it's a one-to-one -one regression or if I'm uh, working with an audience, and the options I give them, the information that we get during a, a past life regression is that information being passed passed to us genetically? So the way you might have your, your, your grandfather's illnesses, your, your mother's looks, your father's personality, is it possible that this information is coded down the gene? Right. Um, or, or, or when I do this, am I opening channels very, very similar to the psychic medium? Mm. Tapping into the Akashic field, yes. uh, tapping into the energy of the universe, now this, I believe, is where this this is where I believe that um, uh, religious and non-religious scientific folk can come together. When we pass away, the energy that leaves us, whether you call it energy, whether you call it soul, spirit, or whatever, for when this when this leaves the body, where does it go? If mm. you're religious, you can say it goes to heaven. Mm. If you're if you're if you're on the science level you will say it goes into the Akashic field, which mm. is all the oneness. And I believe that we are all a oneness. From the Big Bang, we are all connected. And I believe that the energy that when we pass away, it would be such a shame that what we've learned in our life's experiences, just to be switched off, snuffed out with a switch of a light switch when we mm. die. Mm. And I believe that this energy goes into the Akashic field and, and maybe a good practitioner a, a, a regressionist can, or a medium, a psychic can tap into this, this ether, can tap into this atmosphere and, and, and bring in that energy, bring in uh, the, the souls of people parted. Yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? It's, it's, it's incredibly fascinating. And, you know, you must, you must get such fantastic information from people um about themselves about their past lives when you're doing this work Absolutely. and it, it must be satisfying for you but for the individuals too yeah absolutely i've had people who um in in this life uh they've had recurring dreams for years and years and years one particular lady was uh drowning and she used to have it very regular and it used to scare her terribly uh, mm. where she would be it was like as if it was really happening she was dreaming, and just as the ship's going down, she wakes up, so she didn't know what the... Anyway, she came to see me for regression therapy, mm. uh, and I took her into a past life, and it turned out that she uh, was actually on a ship, and we got the name of the ship, where it departed from. It was Spain, going to the Americas, and we got, the, we got all the information for her, and then she actually visualized what the continuation of the dream, oh, and wow. she actually did drown on that wow. ship. Oh my God! So you know to get that. I mean, I I did a regression show a few years ago on the Wirral where I live, and I had a, a young, you're only about nineteen, a young chap who was regressed 
into a past life and he was this is a this is a, an audience show we had about 300 people in the audience and he um uh, it, we, we I, I regressed him back to 1860 around about 1861 and he was uh, a, a pre a, a, um, a, 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 in the church of england right and he uh, was a vicar and he got kicked by a horse and that's what killed him killed he got kicked by a horse and there was gasps in the audience members who were with this young man who said in this life he's terrified of horses terrified of horses so in a past life is this trait passed on because he was killed he was kicked by a horse and died and in this life he hates horses and he doesn't know why so you know is, is, there, it, a, is there a link there i i think there has to be there has to be some continuation but when we go through the birth canal, everything is, it's like the CD is, is wiped, you know, yes. the cassette, the cassette is blank. That's right. Yes. You got a blank cassette, you got a blank record player well, and you've got to start again. But that CD still has some bits left on it. Yes, you know, that's right. Yes. The yeah, bits absolutely. of your song still on the CD. And that's what you, that's what shows up in your life in other yeah, ways. Absolutely. Yeah. And here's one for you, which I, I only heard recently, which I, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And that is the um, uh, what if when you die, when you're passing away, that white light, that white tunnel that they say you go into, mm. maybe that's the, the lighting of, of the um, of the maternity ward <laughs> as you're going through, you're going through to be born again. And the light mm. that you're seeing at the end of the tunnel is the light in the in the in the. <laughs> in, <laughs> yes, in, um, that's a good one. Eternity ward. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was quite good. Yeah, but yeah. I don't think, yeah, it's, it's it's not real, but I just like the idea of that. So you, uh, but, uh, are you uh, are you um, aware of the experiments that were done in eighteen six in the eighteen sixties with um, uh, with a medical doctor in America, the uh, dead weight experiments? No. Oh, in Massachusetts, his name will come to me in a minute. I'm just drawing this from recall. Yeah. Um, uh, a great example, Dr. McDoodle. Dr. McDoodle. You can Google this. Your, your viewers can Google this. Uh, McDoodle, I'm sure his name is McDoodle. And he was um, uh, frontline in a, in a uh, hospital in Massachusetts. And he was with, he was with patients um, who were in the later stages of their life when they were dying. Mm. Uh, and um, he thought, well, and, and basically the experiments that he set up were, he uh, set a set of scales up that were so um, as accurate as they could possibly get in those t in that time period yes. in Massachusetts. And he would be measuring people lying uh, uh, on the bed. And then when they passed over, when they passed away, they lost on average about seven grams within a few seconds. Seven grams. Um, yeah, very, seven very grams. specific. Was it, no, tw was it 21? No, beg your pardon. 21 grams it was. 21, 21 grams. 21 grams. The, the, the weight when they were alive, when they, the moment of death, they lost 21 grams. Mm. Now, if that is energy that's leaving us, you can't destroy energy. You can manipulate it. You can change its form from nuclear to thermal or, or you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the physics side, but you can't destroy energy. So where is that energy going? Is it going mm. into the Akashic field, mm. ready for the reborn, mm. Mm. Uh, rebirth? Have you come across Anita Morjani? Have the you name? Sorry? Uh, Anita Morjani. She has a, an amazing story. Um, she, she had a near-death experience and was basically, she had lymphoma. And she literally within minutes of dying and she crossed the other side and saw some things and had some discussions on the other side and decided to come back. And some of the things that she witnessed, you know, she witnessed, uh, she's, she's an Asian lady living in Hong Kong. I've met her several times and I've been to some of her workshops. Yeah, it's from, the name is familiar, but I'm Yeah, she's a Hay House. She was discovered by Wayne Dyer, Hay House author. Yeah, and she's now a Hay House author as well, uh, with her with her book, 
which is dying to be me or something. Yes, I am aware uh, of it. But there's yeah. so, ma so many interesting people out there. Dolores Cannon, she passed away now. Um, mm. Dr. Brian Wise, um, Many Lives, Many Masters. Uh, mm. Another brilliant, brilliant book. Um, mm. Yeah, he was a psychiatrist in New York many, many years ago. Still alive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, he published this book. And I mean, there's so much evidence of people's stories and what they're happening what's happening and it's very tricky for them to make this stuff up yeah you know and i'm sure there, there there probably are people with you know crazy imaginations but i'm i met in anita in hong kong when she did her very first talk she wasn't even famous then she was just a coach a life coach yeah and i was with some people i had met and I was doing some business over there and they said, you must come to this talk. I went, I had nothing to do. Mm -hmm. And there were only literally about 30, 40 people in the room in this big theater. It was hot, completely empty virtually. And she was on yeah. the stage, very shy, didn't want to talk. In fact, she hardly spoke, but she brought in a Chinese doctor who had all the medical records. Well, the doctor who treated her didn't want to come and talk about it. But there was a different Chinese doctor who brought all the medical records to prove that she should never have survived her illness. All the vitals were just showing that she was going to die within minutes. And anyway, I met Anita face to face and I could still, still see the scars in her neck yeah. from all the, like the, the lymph glands that had swollen to the size of oranges. And it just was not a made up story. You know, you could just tell. And I mean, she's gone on to become famous yeah. and write a book and get discovered and help people with her story. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, there are many others as well. And so if it's happening all over the place and it's, and these things are coming out more and more, Netflix are doing a documentary on it. and. Yeah. You know, people are waking up, people are becoming more in tune with what's going on around them. In the yeah. olden days, you know, we used, it, it must be true, the governments have said so, you know, the, the, that attitude. But now people, That's are, right. uh, uh, people are waking up, they're using, they're using their own brains. And I, I think it's very important that, um, I, I think the people who are going to be watching this podcast uh, um, are going to have like-minded, um, open minds. But yes. you've got to remember that the majority of people aren't, the majority of people are very narrow-minded. And my advice would be to, to, to everybody is to have an open mind, but not that open that your brains fall out. <laughs> I like that. It's true, though, isn't it? Have an open yeah. mind. Yeah. You know, I mean, because don't forget that when we're born, we're conditioned. We're conditioned. People around the world are conditioned with religion. Uh, that there's, there's no mm. change in that. You can't change this. It's set in stone. Mm. Mm. You know, they have been conditioned that mm. this is factual, even if science disproves it. They're conditioned to believe that, and there's no way that you're going to change their minds. So that in itself is a form of hypnosis, isn't it? It totally is. I, I, I remember my mother, who, you, who she's passed on now, but she's Anglo, she was Anglo-Indian, and she went from a Hindu religion Although she had a very British upbringing, so you could almost say she was Church of England, but she married my father, who was Catholic. Um, and they lived in Amsterdam. We were born into the family, obviously. And then we were still going to Roman Catholic Church. And I, every once a week on a Friday morning, there was a very early morning mass, like six o'clock in the morning. And I was an altar boy for, on my knees, falling asleep having to ring the bell every time watching the priest, every time he drinks, you know, the blood of Christ and, yes, yeah. and whatever, and I have to ring the bell and I'm like falling asleep. And I, it, it got to me then I went, seriously, this is what it's about. Yeah. You know, six o'clock in the morning, I've got to do this and penance and, yeah. you know, be uncomfortable. You, you, don't, you and, don't need to do all that to be a good person. You can, you can practice Christian values. Mm. Uh, without any, uh, without going to a pointy building or anything mm. like that, if you're a good, decent person and you like to help people, and you, if you can help somebody without detriment to yourself or connections, well, that is very, very important. In, yes, in my view.
Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, if if there is a if there is a little place up there for you to go to, if you're a good, decent person, you will eventually go there, wherever that might be. Yeah, Alan, uh, Alan, we literally could speak for hours on this topic, and um, really, really fascinating. So, tell, share with the listeners how can they get in touch with you? Um, yeah, there's, for your there's, different, there's different mediums. If yeah. you're in the UK, um, just Google me, um, www.alanbates.tv, or you can go into the hypnotherapy services. Um, this is based for people on Merseyside, from Chester to Liverpool to North Wales. That's my catchment area for people coming to see me for psychological help. If they're in Malta, you just have to Google me, and you, 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 I'm all over uh, the... Uh, the the, the social media platforms likewise on facebook um and if anybody's interested in purchasing any of my books uh they can do the all available on amazon and uh, yeah. uh, my, my favorite one which was my last book uh ufos it's time to wake up um trade secrets which i discuss uh, how to do this how to become a hit and what you need to know the history um also confessions which is a good read for over 18s because of the there's quite a lot of interesting yeah, adult material in that. Okay. Confessions of a Hypnotist. Um, the, the autobiography, Alan Bates, Wide Awake. Uh, and my second best uh, book that I, that I like is Alan Bates, True Ghost Stories. Um, so uh, the, the, I think they're all decent read. You know, they're a decent read. Um, they're all available on Amazon. And I, I know you're saying you're in the Wirral catchment area. But are you doing um, consultations via Zoom as well? Uh, no, I'm not. I like to be no. hands on. I'm old Fine. school where I want that person in front of me so that we can, you know, sometimes I need to give them a, a box of hankies to open up. You know, yes. I need to be yes. able to. No, I, 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 I much prefer uh, being in the company of, 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 um, uh, of my clients. Right. Great. OK. And is that paused at the moment or? Uh, yeah, no, I'm still working because I'm working with people ongoing mental health issues, I have drug dependencies. I've got right. a lot of people coming to see me with cocaine abuse at the moment. Right. I'm getting great results. Um, and um, because of uh, lockdown, people are drinking too much, smoking yeah. too much, yeah. uh, suicide cases. So I'm still oh. working. I'm still oh, working amazing. at the clinic. But I, but I don't do the big group sessions because in the past, I, I, could, I do group sessions with hundreds of people. I'm obviously not doing that at the moment, yeah. Uh, but I will be in Jakarta when we go to Indonesia. We'll be opening up those big, big events for yeah, uh, for, yeah. for people to stop smoking, lose weight, stress, anxiety, um, all the usual therapies that I do on a regular basis. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating, and um, hopefully, when all this COVID stuff is out of the way if you're ever in the midlands let me know and uh, i'll take you for lunch and uh, we can fantastic. have a chat face to face absolutely michael it's been my pleasure thank you thank you very much alan take care if you've enjoyed this podcast please rate subscribe and share at will i'm always looking for more listeners and guests so do get in touch please you can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.